All right. So hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining today's seminar series organized by the Empathic Computing Laboratory. I'm your host, Pai. And our guest speaker for today is Arun Damde, who is currently a lecturer in health, uh, sorry, in the Human Centered Computing Group of the University of Queensland. So his research interest is on mixed reality, um, empathic computing, and human computer interaction. The title of his talk is on the novel uses of neurophysiological signals in extended reality. Um, which is about novel ways in which neurological and physiological sensors are used in extended reality for collaborative and single user setups. So the talk will be about an hour and then later on we'll have a brief Q&A session. Oops, there are more people joining. Let me just quickly admit them in. All right. So there'll be a brief Q&A session after the talk. Um, so without further ado, I'll leave it to you, Arundam. Great. Um, thanks, Pai. And thanks for inviting me for the talk. It's, it's like, um, again, like I'm talking to my home crowd. Here, so I've been part of Empathy Extended Reality Lab myself. So, sorry, Empathy Computing Lab myself. So, it's been really great to be talking to you all. So, like um, Pai mentioned, so I'm from the um, University of Queensland. Um, here, I'm running a lab called Empathy Extended Reality and Privacy Computing Lab. Um, so, University of Queensland is just for, for those of you who don't know, um, it's in, uh, in Brisbane. Right, it's a very beautiful city of Brisbane, although you do not get to see a view of Brisbane from this height, but even if you see it from the ground, it still looks beautiful. Right, and our campus at University of Queensland is um, it's really pretty. Right, so it's probably the best, most beautiful campus you can ever imagine in, in Australia. Right, so you should, should, you should come. But now, um, now this is the time when in our, on our campus, there is a Bloom Festival going on. And this is really uh, a very attractive time to be on our campus, right? Where all the jacaranda flowers, they bloom, and then we have a nice festival around it. It, it looks much uh, better when you are um, here on campus, right? But, but from the images you can see that that's really pretty. Now, now this year, my, my family was supposed to come Um, for the reason you know. Now, I sent a few photos of this to, to them, but I still feel like when I, when I sent those photos to them, um, they said, yeah, it's, it's really good and I wish I, I could have been there with you um, right, during this time. And, and we also have some kind of um, music um, going on here as well during the night. So now what I felt when I sent it to them that there is a disconnect between my joy and my excitement about this, um, this festival and, and the beauty of the campus during this time and what they felt. In the same way, I also don't know exactly how they felt because I wanted them to be here with me during this time. And of course we had other plans, uh, but they couldn't come here. So, so this connection that um, we could have had if we were together, right? We are missing it when we, are talking over Zoom or we are talking over WhatsApp or things like that or Facebook, right? Now, so I guess this disconnect between us is missing um, that, that empathy question that we, we could have otherwise had, right? So if I knew that, okay, they're really happy, so they have come to Australia, they have come to our campus, that could have created even more happiness in me. And if they also saw that, okay, I am quite happy to be here, they probably would have thought, okay, my, my son is there having a good time, so that's fine, and we are all happy. No, it didn't happen. But anyway, probably it will happen next time. Uh, the same way, it's not about just this um, kind of uh, festival things, but if you also think about extreme uh, experiences like riding a roller coaster, right? I, I, I remember as a, as a child when I uh, used to go with my friends on, on this kind of theme parks, we really had a lot of fun, right? And we could share our experience with each other, we could probably sit next to each other, and can experience that, but it doesn't happen this time. This time around, now we all got busy and we are different parts of the world, but how about if we were able to share our experiences with my friends like we used to do as a, as a, as a child, right? So you cannot do it. And even if you, as a third person, if you look at this, this photo, you probably be thinking that, um, okay, that's a roller coaster ride, so people must be either excited or they must be very scared or very anxious, what's going to happen next. Um, but whatever this opinion you have about this ride is, is mostly coming from your own experience, 
it's not really their experience. So you're seeing this as you're, you're imagining yourself riding it, but not you're imagining the other person who are riding it, uh, how they are feeling. If you look at the photo closely, you will see that different people have different facial expressions. It is quite clear that all of them, although they are having a same physical experience, but what they are feeling inside emotionally and cognitively is quite different, right? So you cannot really empathize with them uh, unless you really know what they're feeling from inside. And the same goes for this kind of experience of kayaking, right? If you, if you knew what the other person is seeing, how they are feeling, uh, you probably could connect very well with your loved ones or your friends if you knew exactly how they're feeling. Right now I have shown you a few nice photos that relates to tourism. Hopefully you can, you're not feeling a bit better now that we are not um, traveling at all. Now, besides this kind of um, recreational things, it also works in a workplace setup, right? So if you are trying to, um, if you're at work and you are sitting next to your, uh, your colleague, perhaps you know how they're feeling through their body language, the way they're speaking, the way they're looking at you. But now what we have seen over the, over the few months that we are, we have to, we're kind of forced to work remotely, right? Now, now remote collaboration and uh, this kind of remote meetings, it's going to be a part of our life from, from now on, even if you like it or not. Now, this connection that we might have had if we are sitting together next to each other is going to be missing in this kind of, um, of uh, remote collaboration setups. So the empathy connection, the empathy connection between people is going to be missing. Now, that's something uh, we would like to focus on and we'd like to bring back to the to the life of people, even if they are working remotely, even if they are not next to each other, right? So, so if you, empathy is, as Alfred has said, it's uh, seeing with the eyes of another, listening with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. It's basically empath experiencing the reality of another, right? So now you might have uh, seen this uh, this video or or that is going around this VR application where um, a mother is getting connected with um, her deceased daughter, right? So this is a very touching experience. So me thinking about it being, being a parent um, and of course a father of a daughter, I can feel how intense this experience must have been for the mother, right? Um, so the point is, um, and if you, if you have looked at this video and um, the interview of the mother, you, you might have felt, uh, felt for, the, for the mother, that the experience that she's having. And it is the power of VR that can create this kind of intense empathy or compassion, right? So, so this is the power of, of virtual reality that we can, we can utilize, right? To, to create different kinds of things that are quite quite touching, quite empathizing. Um, so, and that's why many people like Chris Milk, they say so VR is an ultimate empathy machine because you can create whatever experience you like using VR. There is no physical, it's not bound to any physical reality, right? And that brings us to the topic of empathy computing that we have been working on and the empathy computing lab is, uh, is pioneering this, this field. So most of you are already familiar with this, uh, with this definition that, um, that Mark uses quite a lot. So empathy computing is, uh, is basically a system that can understand what people are feeling or their users are fe feeling in terms of their emotion and cognitive states. Uh, it can help you experience the world better. And also it can help you share what you are feeling with others or we can get information about what others are feeling, right? So understanding can be achieved using sensors, like physiological sensors, neurological sensors, and then experiencing and sharing can happen using extended reality, right? So my vision um, in this empathy extended reality lab is to create extra systems that can empathize with this user right and also can collaborate can can help collaborators 
uh, empathize with one another in similar to or even better than in real world scenarios, right? Because like, like we, we know already during this COVID time, that more and more we are going to use this kind of remote collaboration tools and and we are going to miss out on that empathy connection if we do not do anything about it so that's my goal is to change it and make sure that even if we are collaborating remotely we are still connected empathically empathically as we are uh, used to be in the real world right So, and now is a very good time to get into this field and do this research because of this invent of these new, new tools. Now, there are many VR headsets. Those are being, being released that have all these kind of sensors already embedded in them, right? EEG sensors and, and other physiological sensors. And there are many other mobile or very portable um, Physiological sensors like Shima 3 or Empathica E4, and there are many others as you can see so, uh, in this image. So it has become very easy uh, for us to use this kind of sensors and devices to enable uh, an empathic connection or to enable us to, um, to measure these uh, physiological neurological signals and then use it in various ways that like the way we want in, in these environments. Right. So for me, the way I focus on um, empathic XR, and, and in my opinion, the definition of empathy extended reality it is an XR system that can measure, share, adapt to, and manipulate emotion and cognition in real time. All right. So, and today I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about each of these things, how we are we are doing in our our lab, how. Uh, how we are uh, using various physiological and neurological cells um, to achieve this goal, right? So, so first I'll go, I'm going to talk about um, different ways where we can measure physiological and neurological signals in, in XR, right? So first thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, is a work that we have been doing for the last few months is about quantifying presence, right? Like many of you know, presence is a very important topic in DR, right? Because it, it measures how much you are feeling to be a part of that VR environment. How much present do you feel in that virtual environment? Now, traditionally, the way it is measured is using questionnaires. So after you experience the VR environment, then you take, take your headset off, come back to the real world, then answer a set of questions. Now it has some problems. The, the main problem being that all these kind of questionnaires can be a bit biased, can result in some dishonest answers there. Also, uh, people after leaving the VR experience, they may forget exactly how they felt when they were in VR, right? So, so we took an approach to measure presence or somehow to quantify presence using neurological and physiological signals so we can measure it in real time later on right so we created uh, a couple of environments with high presence and uh, and low presence so I'll, I'll show you a quick video but you will you will see that in the high presence and environment we had a bit more uh, a higher visual quality for, of the environment and the and the user had more realistic um, hands and they had more in, more uh, opportunities to interact with the environment right and also there are different sounds uh, so and at the same time when people are experiencing this we are we are measuring their brain signals using a an easy device a 14 channel easy device right and you'll see how this varies So you can see we can measure this, uh, this kind of things in real time, right? And, and you can see a different um, neural activity in two environments, right? Just because they have different presence. So we, we ran a user study with that. And, um, and what we found was quite interesting. 
So there was definitely, like, like we, we expected, there would be a difference between high presence and low presence in terms of um, the brain signals and other uh, physiological signals. What we found was in uh, high presence scenarios, uh, there were higher synchronization between the two hemispheres of the brain, particularly in, uh, in all this, uh, these channels, right? So if you look at this graph on, on, the, on the left, um, the blue bars, they indicate the low presence scenario, whereas the red bars indicate the high presence scenario. And the closer to one it is, uh, it, it, is more, uh, it causes more synchronization. Right, so, so that, that was one of the big differences. We also noticed a difference in terms of heart rate um, in higher presence scenario, there were higher heart rate just because um, they, were, they had to interact more or they had opportunities to interact more. Um, that might have caused a higher heart rate. We've also noticed that higher presence uh, environment cause um, less neural activity in the occipital region of the brain. So that's, that's where we uh, process our, our visual senses. So which, which means it, higher presence environment caused less visual stress uh, because we had better visual quality there. We have also found that higher presence um, caused higher theta and beta activities in the frontal region, which indicates that people were more um, concentrating more and had more attention, uh, paid more attention when they were in a higher presence scenario, right? And we've also noticed that it caused higher alpha activities in the parietal region, which indicates that they had less simulator sickness when they were exposed to the higher present scenario than the lower present scenario. So all of these things can be measured using um, this kind of um, neurological signals. And the goal is if we can then create a model and find out this kind of um, footprints, neurological footprints of presence, then going forward, we can we, we can act one, measure presence using this kind of tools in real time. And also we can adapt to the presence uh, the person is feeling when they're exposed to VR, right? We can adapt, we can increase or decrease the presence based on uh, our application, what we want to do. Now, there is another way, uh, another uh, work that we are doing in our lab is we are trying to find out the effect of network latency on attention and emotion in VR, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a work in progress. A, a student is still running the study, but I just wanted to share it with you. Um, so if you see on the left, um, it's just a Tetris game where they have to just stack this kind of blocks. Um, but on the right-hand side, there are two different levels of presence, uh, sorry, different levels of latency, right? So one is 400 millisecond, one is um, zero milliseconds, so quite real time. Now we are trying to find out if we are, performing a task and there is a latency in our um, in, the, in the system, how we cope with that neurologically and physiologically we're also trying to measure how much attention we pay. And if there is a collaborator, how do we interact with the collaborator in this kind of a in this kind of a scenario where there is a differing latency levels. All right. Um, so hopefully I will be able to share some more results with you in the coming months. There's another work that we are doing is, uh, is about VR storytelling, where we are using uh, neurological and physiological sensors to measure how people feel when they are exposed to a VR story, but when they experience the story from different perspectives. Now, I'll show you a quick, uh, uh, quick video of a story that, that our student has created, um, and then I'll talk a bit more about it. This is Rex from the Galaxy Coast Guard. Mission This is Rex from the Galaxy Coast Guard. Mission log number 0472. I've landed in what appears to be a humanoid spaceship. There's not much time left. An asteroid is coming this way. Too fast to be detected by the humanoid's primitive technology. I gotta get past this guard and warn the captain of the ship immediately. Stop right there! The guard has activated a wall of solid light from his shield. I can use my flash gun to stun him by overloading his eyesight. Good thing I brought a few flash guns with me. They should be sitting on top of a box next to my spaceship.
Sir, do not come any closer. I should reach the captain through this door. There must be a button next to it to open it. Access granted. So now the the Coast Guard goes into the into the cockpit and talks to the captain. Now, as you can see on the on the right um, image, there are three characters, right? One is the guard, and then the, the Galaxy Coast Guard and the, the captain. Now, all of them, if you as a viewer of the viewer, viewer story, if you inherit one of the characters but experience the same story from different perspectives, how you feel about the story? And also after you come out of the story, how you retell the story to others. So how much you, what, what you make out of the story, right? And we are going to measure it using both uh, neurological and physiological um, measures. Plus we are going to see what kind of emotion you express when, um, when you retell the story, right? Now the idea is if we can find out this kind of a footprint of VR, story experiences through their various neurological and physiological measures, then again, we can create adaptive viewer storytelling later on. So we can perhaps increase the engagement using these techniques, we can perhaps increase the engagement of being into the story, how people experience a viewer story in different ways, right? Now this is a, a work that's still in work in progress. I, Will, uh, so a part of this work has been shown into the uh, in the ex Seagraph Asia conference that happened in, in Brisbane, but um, it has now improved further. So hopefully I can show you more later on. And the other work that uh, that we have used uh, we have used this kind of um, brain signals is um, to to enable more accessibility using VR um, the VR applications, right? So if you can, so we assume that people with uh, when we want to use VR, most of them will have access to both of their hands and they can really move around and, and interact. But what about if for some reason the user doesn't have access to their hands for, for whatever reason? Now, how can we enable them to use VR, right? So, so one option is to use brain signals um, using, uh, so, they, so basically what is a BCI or brain computer interfaces and other option is to use special expressions um, to, to do that, right? So we used uh, facial expression technique to enable navigation and interaction using, um, using VR. Uh, and we, what, what they did is they, they were all the same uh, 14 channel EEG devices, which has EMG sensors there as well. And those sensors are basically used to, to detect noise um, in, the, in the EEG data, and then there, there are ways to clean the data. But that noise is used in this particular work to detect what kind of uh, facial expression was there, and then use that into the VR environment to let them operate the, or interact in the VR. So we created three different kinds of, um, of experiences. One is a um, quite calm experience where people have to collect butterflies. Um, in, another one is a bit scary experience where they had to shoot zombies to survive. And the third one was, was neutral where they were just going through a, a warehouse and collecting objects, right? And, and they could interact with three different kinds of facial expressions. They can either move or stop and then create an action. Right, so like here, these three, three expressions were used. Now, what we found is um, when people interacted with uh, facial expression, of course, it caused um, a higher cognitive load be because they had to really uh, do a lot of work. But, uh, and also this is something new that uh, they were learning, right? So the people are not used to use uh, their facial expressions to, to navigate or interact with objects. Um, so we found that, uh, this was the case, but one surprising thing we also found is when people used facial expression, their presence in VR increased. So we, we think that it is probably because they were more engaged and a lot more focused into the VR environment. Um, that's that's probably increased their their feeling of presence. So we need to, we need to dig it deeper and understand exactly what went there. Right, and there are a few other. Um, work that we are doing um, in terms of teaching and learning, 
where um, one of our students has developed um, a bystander training tool for sexual harassment on campus, right? So we, had, we have created a training tool in VR and we compared it with uh, with other currently used 2D interfaces and we're trying to find out um, various um, various um, measures through uh, their neurological signals, how much attention they are paying, and of course, how much knowledge they are gaining uh, through through that um, through that tool. So that's something we will probably present later on. Um, now I'll move on to some other set of work where we used um, neurological and physiological signals to to share between the between a couple of collaborators or share to the user themselves and also uh, together with that i'll talk about a few work that uh, where we use these um, tools to manipulate people's um, physiological signals right so this first work was um, um, a game that we created where people or a couple of games where there are two users in the same room one was playing the game with um, uh, Playing the game, another was just observing the game, but inherited the same body. But what we did is um, we shared the, the heart rate signal of the of the player to the observer. Right? We tried to find out if the observer um, knows about that implicit information about the about the player. Um, does that make any difference in their overall experience? Right. So. I'll, show you a quick video of that. In this research, we explore the effects of sharing physiological states of players in collaborative virtual reality gameplay. Our goal is to improve and enhance users' empathy among collaborators, especially in a remote setting using advanced computer interfaces. To support this study, we developed a collaborative VR framework which shares the player's position and heart rate to the observer in a virtual environment. The observers view the game from the player's position but can rotate their head freely to look around. The player's heart rate is measured by a biometric glove. The measured heart rate is shared with the observer using both visual and audio cues. We developed two games based on this framework. The first game provides a calm and pleasing experience where the player catches butterflies while surrounded by nature. The second game presents a scary and stressful situation where the player tries to survive zombie attacks. We conducted a study to learn the effects of displaying the player's heart rate to the observer. From the insights gathered in this study, we present a set of guidelines for designing collaborative VR experience. Yes, as you have seen, we are providing the heart rate feedback in terms of the heart rate beeping at the bottom middle of the, of the screen. Right? In one condition, we provided the feedback, in the other, we didn't. Now, what we found when we provided the feedback, uh, the people were, um, the collaborators were, um, Kind of communicating more uh, with each other. We've also found that this kind of shared heart rate feedback increased their positive effect. So we measured it using a tool, to tool called positive and negative effect schedule that can measure your positive effect and negative effect in terms of 20 different feelings and emotions. So we found that sharing the feedback increases the positive effect, which is a good thing. Now in the in the last experience, so we created the heart rate feedback that was only audiovisual. Now we realize that, of course, there are many other senses that we have. And how about if we explore that space to provide a multi-sensory heart rate feedback? So we decided to use the haptic feedback together with the audio and visual feedback, right? And we created the different options, different combinations of them, right? And we created a, an, ex, uh, an experience where the person had to stand in front of him on a jeep and the jeep would take them through a jungle safari and they will get their own heart rate feedback in different ways right so here is a quick video of that Oops.
and, and the haptic feedback was provided using the Hive controllers, uh, and it was vibrating in, in synchrony with the heart rate in real time. All right. So, so what we found um, that the audio haptic feedback was ranked the best by the participants. Right. So people thought uh, the visual feedback was a bit more distracting, so they preferred the audio and haptic feedback. And in our future studies, we mostly use audio haptic feedback in our our work. And we also noticed, our, our participant told us that um, they wanted more interaction because in that experience, they were just standing behind the Jeep and the Jeep was taking them through the jungle um, safari, but they didn't have a lot of opportunities to interact. So the next study we created, um, the next um, study we did was where we used the multisensory heart rate feedback, but then we used it for a collaborative setup where one collaborator was sharing the heart rate feedback to the other, right? And of course, there was we also added more interaction learning from the earlier experiences, uh, right? So, so what we did, we created three different um, environments here: one escape room game. So those of you, probably most of you, know about it. Um, it's just you need to find some clues within a given time to exit a room; otherwise, you will get stuck there. And the other option, other environment we created was more of an exploration, quite similar to the last experience that we have shown. There were just two collaborators or two people who were going through um, a few different scenes. In that case, they could talk to each other, but they didn't have to, and there was no interaction involved. Whereas in the escape room game, they had to work collaboratively to find clues, and they had a similar level of priority. And we created a third environment where those two, two collaborators, they had to arrange a few furnitures in a room. Now, in that, one collaborator was taking a load role of an instructor and the other was the follower. So the instructor would say, take this table and put it there and they would do it. So there was a difference in the, in the power that they had, unlike the escape room game. So we, we again use the, audio visual uh, not audio visual audio haptic feedback and i'll just quickly show you the the environment for the furniture arrangement so here is no feedback So let's kind of create two, con two conditions where you provided the feedback versus where I didn't provide the feedback. Now, what we found was uh, when we provided the feedback, um, the, the, so we found a difference of the, uh, of the environment first, that the exploration environment had, uh, had lower positive to negative effect ratio. So this ratio is basically for each negative effect, how much positive, positive effect is generated. So the higher the number, the better. So we could see when um, the feedback was not provided, there was a significant difference. And the environment, the explorative environment rated, um, rated lower than the furniture arrangement game, where they had more interaction to do, right? So, and also in terms of social presence, again, we found that um, the more um, interaction they had, the higher um, the social presence was there. Um, and that's the reason why in all conditions, the uh, exploration environment rated the least. Right. So now moving on from there, we realized that, okay, we can now provide the heart rate feedback to the users, but how about if we now try to manipulate the heart rate feedback and, and what happens there? So we decided to create uh, five different levels of, uh, of manipulation. So in one case, we just provided the real feedback, so no manipulation at all. And then we increased or decreased it, it by plus 30% or 15%. And the users were getting their own heart rate feedback and they were not aware of that manipulation before the study. So what we found that there are five, um, five different emotions that got affected by this manipulation. And those five emotions are quite relevant to the environment that they experienced, which was the, the safari experience that I presented. Um, so there's, there were the interest, excitement, scariness, nervousness, and fear. These are the five things 
of five emotions that uh, were evoked by that environment, and those were actually manipulated. Interestingly, what we found is when you provided them the real heart rate feedback, the intensity of all of these emotions were the least. Um, and also at the same time, when we increased it to the plus 30 level, most of the users realized that it is manipulated. So they, after all, afterwards, when we were doing the debriefing, they said, um, yeah, I, I, could, I thought that there is something wrong because they didn't know that it was manipulated. They thought it could not be my heart rate. So there's probably something wrong in your system, right? So, but the good thing here is that although we could manipulate their emotions just by manipulating the feedback we provided them, it did not necessarily change their raw heart rate or the, or the real heart rate, all right? So, so this manipulation did not really affect their actual physiological state. Now, then we thought, okay, we can then um, provide this kind of manipulated feedback now between the collaborators instead of providing to the user themselves. So we created two different environments in one was more active where people had to again shoot zombies and, uh, and other creatures to survive. And they were told that if one of the collaborators die, they will die as well. So they had to really help each other to survive. Um, and the other environment was a passive environment where they did not really have to interact a lot. Uh, they could just travel around. And this time we manipulated the heart rate feedback between plus and minus 20 levels, percent levels. So again, what we noticed in terms of uh, social presence that the environment had a, had a big role to play where we were the, in the higher active environment, they had uh, more social presence than the lower um, uh, or than, than the passive environment, right? Uh, but we did not notice um, a lot of impact of the uh, of the manipulated heart rate feedback, right? But one thing we noticed that um, the in when the heart rate was plus um, plus twenty, the the collaborators thought the other person is more um, more excited. So what they had to do, they had to respond um, the feelings of for themselves and also what they think is the feeling of the of their collaborator in each of these conditions. So they found that their collaborator were more excited than them when the heart rate was manipulated by plus 20%, right? Um, now we need to find out um, the reasons behind that. Um, and also another thing we found, uh, our, our user said that uh, it, it is good to know that the other person's um, heart rate and how they're feeling, but it did not necessarily change to my action because uh, I knew that they are in VR, so even if I know what they are feeling, uh, but I know that uh, nothing really is going to happen to them. So it did not really change my action in the, in, in the game, right? So that was an interesting observation. Now, all of this that I have talked about are in VR. Now, there's another work in progress where we are trying to do um, the same kind of an experience and create the same kind of an experience in augmented reality. So this is a work in progress and that's really still working on it as I speak. So here, yeah, they have created um, a bomb diffusing game where you can really select. Um, so you have to solve some some problems, diffuse the bomb in a given time, and if if you cannot, then the bomb will go off. Um, so that's the thing. Um, Stop video. So. Yes, now we'll, we'll do some more studies to find out whether there is a difference between the heart rate sharing, physiological signal sharing between AR and VR or not, right? And, and how collaborators um, observe this or how collaborators perceive this kind of shared uh, feedback in AR as well. So in a, in a summary, what we, we have noticed through this set of studies that we have presented, and most of that has been done when I was working at uh, Empathy Company Laboratory at NESA. Uh, what we have found is uh, social presence increases to share the awareness key or, or the heart or the physiological feedback. And also it increases, social presence, presence increases when you have a higher interaction involved. And shared physiological feedback, it can increase communication. So people talk more when they know other person's physiological feedback. Um, 
it can alter emotion, but it does not really alter the real signals, physiological signals um, through the manipulation. And, and it can increase the awareness of the other person or of your collaborator, but it does not necessarily change your behavior or your action. Now, on this point, we have done most of our studies on more on a gaming scenario. But if we do this kind of the same kind of study on a more serious task where people really have to solve some puzzles or need to learn something together, then this effect may change. But this is something we need to explore in future. Now I'll talk about uh, a couple of work that we are doing on the adaptation of by using these kind of physiological signals. All right. So the first work that we did. Um, is we used a cognitively adapt we created a cognitively adaptive VR training system where uh, people had to select a target object among us a group of objects in, in their view right and here on the left you can see the low level uh, and task of for that so it's, it's the least complexity where there are only one or two matching objects that they could really pick and objects were not moving, but on the right hand side at the, at the highest level, uh, they had uh, more similar objects and those objects were moving around, so it was a bit difficult for them to target and, and select the, the right object. Right, And there are 20 levels between them. So what we did to create the adaptiveness is we measured their alpha activity in real time. And we also measured the alpha activity before they started this VR experience through a, a task called in-back task. So, so what, we, what we did up from that baseline data, when we found that their alpha activity is going above the, the, the baseline data, that means they're getting relaxed. So we, in that case, we increase their complexity. And if we have noticed that the alpha activity is going below that, that baseline, that means they are working hard. So we decrease the, the complexity. So that way the, the complexity was, was adapted. Right. So what we found is um, the alpha activity changed between the, the lowest level and the highest level, but their task completion time for each of those levels did not change. And the way we, the, the tasks were designed, um, the, the, the participants could actually finish the entire 20 levels, right? So, so that's something we need to we need to work work more on in our future studies to to create more uh, complexity. But the, the finding was quite interesting because there, the task completion time didn't change. That means that our brain could really um, absorb the complexity without really affecting our motor actions. Or right, so we could really manage it within um, the similar amount of time, even if it was more complex. Now that's one study. Now, one of my PhD students now is working on an adaptive social virtual reality environment. So this is a, a snapshot I, I, I took when we had the first empathy computing lab meeting in VR, uh, I think early this year or, or probably last year, right? So if you look at this, um, this environment, so there are people who are talking to each other, um, but then now there may be more people right because many people are, are joining and using this kind of setups and also if you look outside this is quite high in in the in the environment so if let's say if someone who is in this environment is um, is afraid of of height right so in this kind of scenario they probably cannot engage in the communication or or in the discussion as as much if they would do it if then the, the room was in a um on a ground level, right? Some people may get distracted very easily when there are some noises coming from some other parts, right? I remember when we were having this discussion, there are some others who were, were chatting and, and we could hear that. And for most of us, we can ignore and we can focus on um, our current discussion that we're having, but for some people, that may be a bit too distracting, right? So the, the point is how about we can create an adaptive social VR experience where all of these things can be measured using neurophysiological signals about their attention um, or their anxiety or their fear, those things we can measure. And then we can adapt the en environment based on this kind of uh, information that we can, we can gather, right? 
So, so my student, uh, Pat, so she is running a, a focus group next week. So if any of you are interested to, to take part in, in the focus group, please send an email to, to Pat. So it's, uh, here is her email address. And also, if you want to sign up, here is the Google link for that. So all you have to do is to just be wherever you are. You need to have access to your own VR headset. You can, and the, the focus group will happen in, in VR. So a focus group about social VR in social VR, all right? So, so I'm quite excited to, to see how this project unfolds. But if you are, I'll send an email to the group. So please circulate it and the study is next week. So it will be great if you can participate. Right, that's one thing. And, and of course, like I said before, we are going to, to create adaptive uh, VR environment, sorry, adaptive presence environments and also adaptive VR storytelling. So this is some of the work that we would like to pursue in future. Uh, there are some other work uh, that uh, we, would, we are currently doing and would like to do more in, in future is about um, creating more emotional and cognitively adaptive interfaces for teaching and learning. That's one of the areas that I'm quite interested in. And recently, um, I think in, in, in Empathy Computing Lab, we have work, we are collaborating on a hyperscanning study where we are trying to understand how brain synchronization work between two collaborators. So Amit and Ishan and Ashkan, they are, they are taking a lead on that, which is great. And then we also need to find out how effectively we can share emotional and cognitive states so that we can create that empathy. So in some of the uh, studies, we found that people may not have paid enough attention to the feedback being provided to them, right? So what is a better way of providing that feedback? And also another thing is, is we have just used um, heart rate feedback to provide between, between the collaborators, but is this the only thing that we can do? Can we provide uh, some other information, some other like GSR or their, their level of their attention or anything else? How can we create different kinds of visualizations to make um, people understand that, uh, that shared information better, right? And another way, another thing that we are working on is to making XR interfaces more accessible using uh, neurophysical signals, like we, one of the studies we presented using facial expressions. We need to work more on that uh, to refine the model. And uh, we will also would like to work on some brain computer interfaces as well as we go forward. And we I just talked about the storytelling and adaptive storytelling in VR. Now that's all I had to speak about today. And, but before I end, I'd like to really acknowledge the work that my students have done and all my colleagues and collaborators like, like you. So I'm quite grateful to all of you. And um, thank you if you have any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation, Arindam. It was really interesting and also quite related to most of the works done by the student, being done by the students here actually. So we are now um, open to questions. And if there are any, please just raise your arms, your, raise your arm in the uh, participant page. Otherwise, you can also type it down on the chat page and I'll read it out for Arindam to answer. So, um, yeah, is there any questions from anyone? So maybe I can turn the sharing now. Yeah, sure. Any questions? Maybe I'll, I'll start with the first question, um, which I think perhaps some of the students here may have in mind, actually. Um, so, some of the um, initial works that you showed were the combination of EEG sensing with uh, VR, which was which is really great, I think. Um, however, and that's also something that we are doing in our, in our lab, as you may know. Um, however, some of the main challenges that we face is the motion artifact, especially from using EEG devices, which is very susceptible to noises, any, any form of small motion, which is which makes it extra difficult because it's paired with VR and VR requires motion, right? So I was just wondering what are the steps that maybe you or your students have taken to, to filter these um, motion artifacts or, or some, some ways to, so that you could say that the signals that you get is not from moving your arms, but rather from the emotions or cognitive load. Um, yeah, so what, that's, a, that's a good point. And, and we, we are also quite susceptible to this, this issue. So we have another, um, another professor here so who, who is a professor of psychology and they also use VR um, for some of their work and they use EEG a lot. So what they do 
is I, I'll come in a moment to point what what we do. So they have a kind of a bar, and then there is a chin rest. So you really have to put your chin there, so you do not move your head at all, and then you just see something, and and then just measure brain activity. So in that case, you can of course eliminate most of the of the artifacts that way. But that's not really a way you use VR, right? So we are trying to do it in a sort of in a in a way that's somewhere in the in the middle and totally free um, interaction versus totally this kind of um, block scenario. So we have asked our participants in most of the all of our work where you, where you have used VR uh, or EG to, to sit on a chair. So they do not really move a, a lot and um, but then most of the interactions they, they were doing while sitting. So in, in that way we could create less noise, but still there are noise and then there are some other techniques to remove the noise before you do the analysis. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, any, any questions from anyone else? I, I had a question, um, Ty, and, um, mm -hmm. and then there's a great um, presentation. Um, near the beginning yeah. of the presentation, you talked about measuring the gamma activity and facial expression. I think it was the first or second example of work you did. Um, was that using the um, EEG sensors across the top of the face, or how did you measure the activity in the gamma? So, or yes, it was sensors? using the, um, the emotive EPA Plus uh, um, EEG device. So, they, right. they export uh, these different frequency levels uh, along with raw data. So, we, we measured using that device. And they also have EMG sensors as well that measures the muscle movements. Oh, I was going to ask you about that. So, so you had EMG sensors you're using also? Yes, in the, in the same. Um, was this put into the head mount display or you just stuck them on the face or how did you do that? It's part of, uh, I think it's part of the, um, the EEG device itself. Oh, oh the Emotive, the Epoch Plus has EMG sensor? Yes. I, I think it's like, Okay. Yeah. But that must only be across the top of the head, right? Not all over, right? like wouldn't be on the cheeks and eyebrows and so on. Yes, I need to double check exactly where it is located. So. Yeah. That it would be around here, so they have a oh, okay, or they have three here, so one of them. So I'm not sure exactly where it is. But. Interesting, yeah. I know the, the new um HP Omnicept um uh head mount display is coming on the market in the first quarter of next year, and that one has EMG sensor in it as well with eye tracking and heart rate as well. So that I think that'll be very useful for your research, probably. Yeah, I'm looking forward. Right. Um, they don't. They don't have EEG, but they. Um, you can. You can of course use it with an EEG uh, sensor also. Yeah. I have a question. If thanks, That's Arindam. True. Yeah, I'm Atia from UQ. Thanks for a great presentation. Just wondering, uh, have you ever uh, measured distraction in VR, for example, by measuring eye movement or pupil size, or is or I mean, how was your experience? Um, no, we did not explicitly measure distraction yet. We, we did use eye trackers and we, we measured pupil dilation to, as an indication of their, um, their attention and, uh, and emotion, but we did not use it for distraction yet. But that's a good point, we, we would like to do it. So the, the, the work that I presented about um, yeah, the, it's currently work in progress with the different levels of latency. Now, one of the things we, expect that there will be less attention when there is a higher latency. And to do that, we are going to use eye trackers for to measure exactly where people are looking at and how long they are fixating on one point. So it, it can be a, a good way of measuring um, distraction in, you know, in, in PR environments using eye trackers. Great, thank you. No worries. Of course, we, we, we can talk about it. Yeah, I'm interested to know the outcome later. <laughs> Thanks. Sure, sure. Any other questions? Um, I, well, I had another question as well. It seems like um, 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 some of the experiments you've only um, just started testing with in, in one particular VR environment, for example. So I'd be interested to see um, how what you think about how reliable the results would be across multiple different VR experiences, because it's very difficult, of course, to run a, a you know, motion measuring um, uh, system across lots of different VR experiments without using lots of different experiments. So I'm not sure if you 
are confident that the results you're finding will also transfer to other PR experiences or, or sometimes the emotion and feedback will depend a lot on the particular characteristics of the experience you have to change, test it in different types of environments? Uh, yes, that's a good point. So I, I think the, the work that we have done is, is just creating the fundamental um, results for now, but it will definitely, we need to validate it on different types of environments and uh, in a, I would say more in more serious environments that involves teaching and learning or doing some other type of work than just playing a game. Like one of the participants said that um, I knew that I'm playing a game and I'm in VR. So even if I have, uh, I know their physiological signals, it don't really, didn't really change anything in me. I didn't really um, change my action. Now that clearly says that um, that if we have a different kind of more serious thing, there may be a difference, right? And and, and it, it's not uh, the games that we they have just played is it's not enough to validate it across the board. But that's something we need to do in, in later studies. We are creating different types of environments now to work on it. It's so, so what do you think yeah. were the key research um, areas that to go doing research going forward? So for example, more reliable emotion detection or ways to um, share emotion or more on the brain side or social? Do you have some ideas about what would be the good directions to work going research to going forward? So from, from my point of view, I think the interesting point from going forward is to create adaptive interfaces. And that involves being able to measure emotion and cognitive states more accurately. Although this is not something that I personally research on, um, but those who do research on measuring emotional and cognition based on physiological signals, I have to rely from, on their algorithms that they come up with on their models. But then using those models, and, and they're improving every, every day as we speak. So using their models into our XR interfaces and to make it more adaptive. And the reason I say that adaptive interfaces is important because when people have in a um, good emotional and cognitive state, when they're doing a task or when they're learning something or when they're training, they will have uh, more opportunity to retain that knowledge and, and learn more effectively. So that's the reason why I think adaptive interfaces will be better. And it can also be used in different kinds of um, therapeutic applications using VR as well. Yeah. Um, I have two questions about the um, presence actually. So. Um, one of your first earlier papers, you showed um, how to measure presence with physiological signals, which I think was quite interesting. I, I was just wondering, like, how, how exactly is presence defined in the context of the signals? Because, say, you get the results showing the two different scenarios, and how will you know that it's due to presence as opposed to, say, cognitive load, or maybe some emotions that stirred from watching, from experiencing the environment. How can you say that it's presence as opposed to the other factors that could probably influence um, physiological signals? Yes, that's that's true. It's particularly it, it is true for the the heart rate feedback, right? So whether the heart rate feedback increase because of their physical movement or because of the presence itself, right? So yeah, I think that's that requires more more work to really. Um, identify, so design studies in a way that can identify this issue separately, right? So it, it is just the first study where we are right. trying to measure this um, neurophysiological effect of presence. We need to do more work on that. Yeah, yeah I saw that you also uh, had a measure of presence in the um, facial expression paper where you use facial expression as, as um, interaction. So I was wondering for that, for that presence measure, were you using signals as well or was it like um, questionnaires? No, for that we use questionnaires. Questionnaire based. We right. use letter interest questionnaire. Yeah. Um, maybe one or two more questions, anyone? Um, I have a quick question. So uh, thanks and it was a very wonderful and insightful presentation. Yeah. So in the adaptive social VRs and uh, project that uh, you mentioned, so how are you deciding on the parameters like to manipulate basically to make it adaptive as in, was, is it like task based uh, parameters that you want to adapt or like how, 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 what's the thought process about that? Yes. Yeah, so that's why we are running a focus group. So that the uh, main discussion point of the focus group is to identify these, uh, these parameters. 
right? So, and it will definitely depend on each individual user. That's why it, it's so powerful if you can customize up your environment based on each individual users, um, version of the states and other preferences in real time, that's, that will be a game changer in my opinion. But uh, to really uh, identify the right things to manipulate or adapt is uh, something we need to work a bit more on. And this focus group will have a discussion about with people who have experienced social VR before, so okay. they can, uh, so we can identify some of these parameters now, and then we'll do more studies and design environments based on this this input, and then we'll do more studies to find out whether those are actually effective or not. So yeah, so it's it's a process. We I don't have an answer to tell you now uh, what we can manipulate, but of course it, it's, it's an understanding VR. There's a wide range of things that we can manipulate. Right, starting from visuals to sounds to many other things, um, so so we need to work on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Boys. Okay. Maybe one last question. Anyone? One last question. Maybe I'll ask. I'll ask the last question then. So um, uh, I find the the study that you had for. I understand it's still an ongoing study. So. Maybe the answer is not clear yet, but I find it, it interesting that you try to un, uh, understand the quantification for latency or the of or perceived latency in VR. Um, when coming up with this idea of latency in VR, were you is there a, like a scenario that you think latency could be beneficial, or, or are you just trying to understand the correlation between latency and the physiological signals? Because to my knowledge, the lesser the better in general. Um, but is there any case where you would see that latency could be beneficial in some cases? Um, not really. So, so we are trying to find out. So that that idea of that project came from another project that that we are not doing. So we are collaborating on this project with another another group, and they are more interested into reducing the latency, hmm. right? So network latency. And um, now we wanted to find out how users get affected by this latency. So it, do we so how much latency is acceptable to you? now if you cannot of course get zero latency there will always be a certain amount of latency but how much is acceptable and does not really affect users usage of the system whatever they're using so this is the first step towards measuring that so if you find out that even if you have about 100 milliseconds of latency it doesn't really make a big difference then probably that group because they are more on a, on a commercial group they would probably work to achieve that hundred millisecond mark, rather than trying to achieve the zero zero mark, right? So, yeah, yeah, that's a great point, actually. Yeah, all right. Okay, thank you very much, um, Arundam, for your um, presentation as well as your insight on this research, as well as every participant who has joined for the seminar. Uh, so keep in mind um, for the next. Yeah, sure. So we will have for the the next seminar in the next two weeks. So please. Um, um, keep in touch with the, the updates from from our site and thanks once again and i'll I'll end the recording from from my side